Luxury cars, large homes, extravagant vacations, money can buy you a lot of things, but can it make you sick? One psychologist has suggested that money doesn't buy happiness. What it buys is a lack of culpability. Was this a legitimate defense or just another example of the favorable treatment of the rich in our justice system? This week's episode is Ethan Couch, Affluenza Teen. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Of all the episodes we've done. Yep. This one infuriates me the most. Wow. We're on 80, what, 80, almost 80, 80 something. something of 80 episodes. This one gets to me the most enraged. My blood was boiling researching <laughs> and reading about this. For sure. For I sure. remember when it happened. I say As do I. Of course, I didn't read into it as much as I have now. But I hated this piece of shit then. <laughs> and... Nothing has changed seven years later. Well, it's funny you say that because our the suggester of our episode this week is none other than my mother, who uh, offhandedly, as we spoke on the phone one day, goes, you know what y'all should cover? That little shit in Burleson. <laughs> He's is, back in the news. He that is a shit the, in Burleson. That little affluenza shit. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll look into it. it. A sh- little shit in Burleson is a very good way to describe him. You know, it, what trash. Oh, for sure. And I uh, was in law school when this happened. And I just, you know, I was head down. I was working full time and in law school. So I just sort of saw the headlines. So another one that I'm glad we have gotten to spend more time with looking into. And it just makes me so sick and so sad. Yeah. It's so a sad. tragic, tragic story. Oh, I just I, I got I and I, you know, I think I have a probably a higher tolerance between the two of us of like very graphic things of looking at graphic. Oh, things. yeah. I I do not look at graphic things. And re- re- I don't love to, but I will. Or like reading about really, really graphic things and th- just reading about the ac- the incident. I won't say accident. The incident that happened here. I started getting sweating. Yeah. My heart was racing. And ever since then, I've been drive like white knuckle driving. It just really affected me. Yeah. As um, a parent, it is uh, exceptionally upsetting. Yeah. And these types of things are what keep me up at night. It's for sure. Who? Oh man. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And we're talking about, as Nancy said, this little shit in Burleson. <laughs> Ethan Couch. He was, this incident happened in 2013 and he's recently come back in the news. So he's kind of topical once again. Yes. So we decided to cover it. This happened not too far from where we live. Yep. So, uh, and I always feel like when things happen around here, it's a little more personal than if it happened somewhere else. For sure. Actually, I was talking to a friend of mine whose parents live in this town, and I just sort of offhandedly said, oh, yeah, we're going to cover Ethan Couch, the affluenza teen. And she said, oh, my God, you know, that road. I, one of her family members owns a business up the street from that. And uh, she said, my aunt always says, something's going to happen on that road. Mm. It's just a real twisty, turny, yeah, windy dark. road. And when it happened, she said her family members, like people in the town just drove over to the accident scene. So it's such a small community that there's word in the streets, basically, that there's something going on over there. Let's see if we can go help. Let's see what's going on. So it is even though the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex is, you know, six million people or more. Now it's growing. Mm -hmm. And even that we still have these little microcosm communities. Sure. But this is something that I mean, had it gone differently, had it gone how it's supposed to have gone. It's a non-event. But because of how it went, it it blew up. Yeah. Every time you look this up, it's just it's like slide, not slideshows, but um, just com- compilations of Whoopi Goldberg on The View and Geraldo Rivera and yeah. Anderson Cooper all talking about this huge thing that it kind of puts us on the map. But for not really the reason that we no, want to be. No, I think rarely are you put on the map for something you want to be put on the map for. It's true. Well, it's like my I mean, friend- Dallas is on the map. <laughs> not we crazy. had a president assassinated here. <laughs> this what uh, my friend Alicia's came from Philly this weekend, and she said, 
you guys lean pretty heavily into the JFK stuff. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you look in things to do in Dallas. She's like, here's where he was shot. Here's where the shooter was. Here's where the shooter was caught. Here's where the shooter lived. I think if you're like, looking at things to do, it probably seems that way. But really, we don't nobody there. talks That's about it or like goes. No. And I drove by the grass scene all the other day and there were people out there and I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, it's it, but I mean, as someone who lives here. I don't really do it. <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we don't ever talk. About to be fair, it. Paris and I on our second date, we did go to the grassy knoll. We were near it. And I was like, do you want to go to the grassy knoll? Ella took a dump on the grassy knoll. Oh, no. I mean, not on it. Okay. She just squatted down. She was grunting as she stood In there. her diaper. She's like, yeah. here's what I think Same. of your theory. The I did it. As she dropped the deuce. Yeah. Oh, man. Welcome to Texas. <laughs> well, let's get into it. Fred Couch was born in West Virginia. During his childhood, his family moved to Mineral Wells, a small town west of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where he graduated from high school in 1983. A psychologist would later testify that Fred was always angry and that he had a short fuse. According to D Magazine, that psychologist further testified that Fred was a big guy, kind of rednecky, didn't take no shit from nobody. And there's a litany of times where he had disagreements with people and he wants to go outside and settle it. He's rough people up, and he's loud. Sounds like a treat. <laughs> you know, it's one of those people, I think, from just people's description, that he's one of those people that you walk, you know, you and I have both worked retail jobs or service industry jobs, where they walk oh, in, yeah. and you see him, and you just go, God damn it. You just go to the bathroom. Yeah, you just exactly. leave your shift. You say it's Time not worth break. it. Yeah. Exactly. Hang up the apron and he walk out. He looks like he's always got a bone to pick for with sure. someone. For sure. He's going to talk to the manager. And oh, yeah. Not only that, the manager. After he cusses you up for sure. every which way a Sunday. For sure. And he's never wrong, even though he's always wrong. No. Yes. Yeah. Well, around the time of his high school graduation, Fred met a 30-year-old woman named Gay. The two were married, and by the time Fred turned 21, he had worked his way up at a sheet metal business in nearby Cleburne, just south of Fort Worth, to the role of owner and president. Not a large company, Cleburne Sheet Metal has about 40 employees, and according to D Magazine, the company completed large-scale metal roofing jobs. While small, they have an estimated annual sales of just under $10 million, according to Hoover's, a business research company. It's a case of you think, well, I don't know, metal sheet roofing is boring. There's money in it. A lot of companies that you would like scrap metal and th or just things that you don't really think about. There's tons of money. I in worked it. at a tile factory once and tons that was of money in that probably so much. It's because it's such low mark. I mean, it's such low cost and then you sell it for way more. I mean, it and was it's always needed. I have spent a lot of time in Cleburne, Texas. Oh, really? That is where my grandparents lived. Oh, no way. What's so, it like? Please describe. It's a small town. Mm -hmm. um, man, as we all know, my memory is not the best, but I have great <laughs> memories of going there to visit them. Mm -hmm. At 6 a.m., they would always get up to go to the Dairy Queen to have coffee with their <gasps> friends, and they would all just sit around and have coffee and talk. That's how you know you're in a wonderful, wonderful small Texas town, because the Dairy Queen. I used to visit my godmother in Mount Vernon, and the exit, there was the Dairy Queen, and that was the go-to spot. Oh, For yeah. those of you not in Texas, Dairy Queen is a drive through restaurant. You can also go in and eat. They have delicious food like steak finger baskets. Steak so fingers and gravy. I think we've talked about Man, DQ. I love Dairy Queen. And Texas Toast. This is DQ country. DQ. That's right. Yeah. So that's their and, motto. <laughs> <laughs> and they the blizzard. So you get this ice cream mm. concoction that's so thick and creamy that they tump it over with no lid on it to show you how thick and creamy yeah. it was before they so serve it, it to you. So it won't fall out. And so in all these small towns, there's always a Dairy Queen if you're on a small town Texas road trip. There's always a DQ. And then if you live in the small town. Stop. Stop and get the steak finger basket always. with gravy and a cookies Mystic. and cream blizzard. Thank us later. Mesquite had a, a Dairy Queen. There's still Dairy Queens around. Oh, yeah. We hung out at it. So it's just, it's a, a must also, see. Also uh, a dilly bar. Oh, what? It's and, just the ice cream, the <laughs> soft serve that's dipped in the chocolate hard shell. Oh, that's, and we were at a Dairy Queen when I was little. And my mom, she tends to just act incredulous at everyday things. One time my sister and I said, we're going to cook, bake chocolate chip cookies. And she just went, chocolate chip cookies? As if no one's ever baked that before. So we were at Dairy Queen and she looks down into the frozen case because they sell their own packaged frozen treats and they sell frozen bananas. That's one of the things that uh -huh. they sell. It's like, are they, they're chocolate covered, right? Mm -hmm. And my mom looks down as we're paying for our steak finger basket. And she's like, chocolate covered bananas. And the man behind the counter was so deadpan. He was like, ma'am. 
people come from miles around for my bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that. Sir. I've never had one, but I'm sorry I've, we I've had you. a chocolate covered banana. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. Not a not a huge banana and chocolate fan. I don't want to be tricked into eating fruit. I, oh, I love fruit, but. I like it more when it's covered in chocolate. If I'm going to cover something with chocolate, it should be a marshmallow or a rice krispie. See, I can't stand marshmallows. What? No, I don't what? like marshmallows. What? There's oh, the texture makes me want to throw up. Yeah. Uh, you no also, s'mores. They're not. They're not vegetarian. Oh, that's true. You're vegetarian. We can't have that. Um, it's made out. Of- I'll, I'll eat it on a s'mores if it's like melted down. But like a whole marshmallow, the thought of eating that makes me cringe. Wow. Like, oh. Yeah, but if it's like. In something like a Rice Krispie treat true, true. or melted down on a s'mores, yes, yep. I will eat it. But I don't like it in cocoa or huh. anything like that. You know what? They're kind of slimy. Okay, that's fair. They they're 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 chalky and slimy. It's chalky, and when you suck it, then it's slimy. How, how like what? Did, how can it be both of those? It doesn't a, make sense. What abomination is this? <laughs> yeah. But I do love chocolate covered strawberries a lot. So we're in small town Cleburne. This man has graduated. He's 21. He's running a sheet metal business. And he's married to and a lady. And he's married to a woman quite his senior. Yes. Together, Fred and Gay had one daughter, but eventually divorced. In 1996, Fred would meet Tanya, his future second wife. Tanya was born in Paris, Texas. At the age of 15, she had dropped out of high school. And by 18, she was married and pregnant with her first child. Less than 10 years later, she divorced earned her GED, and eventually found herself working various jobs at the sheet metal company owned by Fred. Some sources say this is where the couple met, while others say they met at Lake Pat Cleburne. Well, I'm not surprised that there's varying stories. (laughs) Yeah, they're not very forthcoming individuals, and they're pretty shady, so they can't even get their story straight as to how they met. (laughs) So there you have it. Tanya and Fred Couch were married in a small town in East Central Texas in 1996, a little less than a year after meeting. The two had a far from ideal early life or marriage. As far back as 1989, Fred had been charged with passing a worthless check. In addition, over the years, he's been charged with four criminal misdemeanor charges and 18 traffic violations, including driving without a license and doing 95 in a 60 mile per hour zone. So we're all guilty of traffic violations here and there and even like as a lawyer you have to report or you get in trouble if you break the law if it's something that has to do with the moral turpitude but sh- repeated traffic violations is also reportable because it shows a flagrant disregard for rules yeah most people if they get a ticket they're going to drive extra cautious and be extra careful of going to the speed limit because also isn't it once i don't know if this is everywhere but in texas If you get a ticket and you do like deferred adjudication, then if you get another ticket within the next like year or something, your fines double and then you're screwed and you're out a ton of money. So most people would would be very cautious. He's almost takes it as an offense and doubles down on how shitty he's going to be. For sure. Also, it uh, it caused your insurance rates to go way up. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, in 1992, in a particularly damning interaction, Fred Couch was pulled over by police under suspicion for driving under the influence of alcohol. When questioned by the police officer, Fred angrily growled, I make more in a day than you make in a year. When asked several years later in a sworn deposition if he said something like this, Fred said, Probably. Well, you know, he's not backing down from what he said. Oh, he's never wrong. No. He he wears his assholeism with pride Uh those are the worst types of people unrepentant assholery that just they take it as a point of pride to be Uh as completely shitty as they can possibly be yes it's all comes from a place of insecurity Uh and not feeling uh like you're worth much but it's hard to look past this type of behavior and get to the heart of that and feel any kind of like sorry or empathy for someone when they're acting but like they don't that. give a f and also i always want to be like who hurt you who did this to you yeah well, you're like this for a reason probably if we looked into his childhood who knows? there's probably a lot there too fred was also charged with passing another worthless check in 1994 he has also been accused of evading arrest as well as assaulting his wife tanya In total, he has so far racked up 22 accusations, according to the Daily Mirror. Tanya has also had her brushes with the law. She apparently had a similar driving style to her husband. 
In 2003, she was charged with reckless driving for pulling up behind another driver before speeding up beside them to force them off the road onto the shoulder. The Daily Mail detailed several other traffic violations, including failure to secure a child in the car. That's what we call road rage. Dude, road rage scares me. It does. So many road rage. You never know who you're driving on the road with. And in Texas, they may have a gun. Oh, yeah, definitely. It happens all the time. That's why as mad as I might get at somebody cutting me off or doing something, I'm never going to flip someone off or like yell or I would never try to run somebody off the road because that's how you get a gun pulled on you. For sure. Or they come back for you. Yeah. I, I also, told y'all about that fight. <laughs> yes. This on the side of 635. Full out fist fight. Yeah. And, and we, that video went viral of the guy that jumped out in traffic and pulled out a machete and just busted out their back windshield. Wild. Jumped back in his car and yeah. sped away. You don't know who has a machete or a gun or people is just are. nuts and is going to follow you home. And I, People are unhinged, so don't take the risk. No. It's also hard to do random acts of kindness that often, but I do drive you know, to and from work. So I just make it a point to let everyone who has their blinker on. If, I'm like, you're being good. You use your blinker. I will let you, you in front of me. Reward good behavior. I reward good behavior. I always let you don't people. reward the people that drive down the shoulder in a line <sighs> no. of traffic trying to get on the on ramp. Your and wife cut over at the last second. It's either your wife or you. Better be in labor. Yeah, if you're doing that, dude. I'm. I love the people that put their car in like half in the lane and half on to block the em. side to block them. And then have you seen that video that also went viral of that car speeding down <laughs> and the he didn't know the guardrail for the median was in the middle of it. He just plowed. I mean, they were fine. But I'm like, serves your ass right. I mean, don't. we're all trying to get to the same place at the same time. Unless you legit have a medical emergency, wait your ass in line. And like if you do, call 911. They'll send an ambulance. They're yeah. allowed to drive wherever they want. You probably shouldn't be driving anyways if you have a medical emergency. True, like true. That. Well, amidst continued run-ins with the law, the couple decided to start a family of their own. And a year after marrying, welcomed their son, Ethan, into the world on April 11, 1997. When Ethan turned three, the family moved to Burleson, Texas, a suburb just west of Dallas and hometown of Kelly Clarkson, to a sprawling 4,000-square-foot home, fully equipped with a pool, playground, barn, and a 6,000-square-foot workshop according to the Belleville News Democrat. It's a big ranch home, sprawling, I would use the term. Yes, and Burleson is kind of peppered with wealth like this and then lower-income families. Down it's, home, yes, salt yeah, of the more, earth folk. More salt of the earth. Ethan attended Anderson Private School, an elite school located in Fort Worth that caters to students with particularly high IQs, with many students attending college by age 16. That was the thing. He was actually a smart kid. Super smart. And teachers said he's he's a smart kid, but his he couldn't get out of his own way. And his parents, instead of rewarding like that type of behavior, just were fucking him up so bad that it kind of just got brushed under the rug that like he's actually a smart kid. He's, yeah, he was well advanced for his age. Yeah. According to information that later came out at his sentencing hearing. Ethan slept in a small bed in his mother's room. Tanya allegedly thought of Ethan as her protector and wanted to keep him close by. The boy was soft-spoken, and his mother and father had difficulty telling him no. One of Ethan's teachers would later tell D Magazine that Tanya loved the boy so much that she couldn't say no to him. If you're raising young men, you've got to learn to say no. I'd like to amend that statement to say, if you're raising young people, human beings, (laughs) you've got to learn to say no. For sure. This is, these parents need to read Love and Logic. And that's the, you briefly have told me about this book. That's the parenting book. It's a parenting book. It's a very well-known parenting book. And it basically describes, I want to say like four styles of parenting that pretty much every parent falls under. Mm Mm-hmm. These would fall under the, I believe it's called Complete Idiots. Savior. Yeah, fuckheads. Um, <laughs> also, helicopter parents, the parents that think they're helping their kids out by swooping in and saving the day and always saving them from their own mistakes or trouble, never allowing them to fail and get back up on their own. Mm-hmm. And they set them up for a lifetime of not knowing how to solve problems, not knowing how to deal with real world disappointment and situations because. They've been taught that no matter what they do, their parents are going to come in and rescue them. This is apparently very common because I had a friend at a, another law firm say a 
candidate for a job brought their parents to the brought their mother to the interview. A a, a person trying to be oh, a yes. lawyer. Oh yes, yes. I believe it was a law student interviewing for a very prestigious law firm, prestigious summer clerk. This was not my law firm. I will full disclosure. And she said that the receptionist sent an email and said, I don't know what to do. There's a mom out here. What was, what did the person say she was there for? Um, the, the candidate, were they just like, this is my mom yeah. and acted like it was completely normal. The mother would be there. Yeah. It's, it, that is, that is this type of case then. It was, the almost, mother has probably held that child's hand from day one. And now when they're 22, 23 <laughs> trying to apply for a job, it's delusional. It's crazy. Imagine, it, being in a relationship with a pro- with that kid, trying to marry into a family uh, like that, run, run for the hills, run for the hills. That's a mother in law from hell. For you sure, you're never gonna win. You're never gonna be good enough for her kid. Uh-uh. Who? Uh, spoiler alert! Did they hire the person? No, okay. Person didn't get the job. Didn't get the job. They did <laughs> they hire, they the, hire mom. the mom. Okay, good. <laughs> the good. Mom. They did. Good. They're like, we actually need a din mother. Yeah, like she's great. She's really. She's friendly. <laughs> she's kind. Yeah. Maybe that's why it, she had an ulterior motive. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to live vicariously through my kid until I can usurp their dreams and make them my own. <laughs> Ditch that zero, get a hero. Well, the couches made no effort to hide their tumultuous family home. Educators saw them get into screaming matches with one another in the school parking lot, all in full view of Ethan. When Ethan was nine, his parents' marriage ended in a bitter and hostile divorce. In one meeting with a social worker, Fred hotly confessed that the marriage had been a mistake from the start, according to the Belleville News Democrat. Fred went on to say that Tanya was a drug addict and had given prescription Vicodin to their young son on several occasions. Well, it's hard because I know in hotly contested and hostile divorces, people make stuff up. But also, maybe this is not made up. Yeah. I mean... I like to say there's three sides to every story. Mm -hmm. Yours, theirs, and the truth. There's a Dick Van Dyke episode where it's his version, her version, and then the goldfish's version. And the goldfish is is the the right version. But of course, in one, the one person is just the worst, and the other one's like, I'm so sorry, my love. Yeah. And then flip flops. Perception's reality. You see things how you want to see them. Mm -hmm. But she was prescribed prescription pills, and given the fact that they did not say no, and she he was treated like an adult. He was not sure. treated like a child. They treated him as a peer. Mm-hmm. And when you blur the lines like that, that you don't even, it doesn't occur to you like, oh, this is my nine-year-old son. I shouldn't be giving uh, opiates to. These are selfish people. <laughs> it's it's just wild. For sure. I always, I, I think there's a healthy balance between being friends with your children, mm-hmm. but beyond a friend, they need... A, an adult yeah. and a parent. And when you just kind of decide, no, that's not the role I want to play in my kid's life. I'd rather be their best friend and have them like me. You lose control real fast. Recipe for disaster. How are they going to respect someone who, it, it, after years of letting them do whatever they want, then tries to put their foot down? You've mm-hmm. lost that battle. Oh, it's too late. Way too late. Well, Tanya's story to social workers was that she had long suffered verbal, emotional, and physical abuse at the hands of her now ex-husband. She also claimed he had been unfaithful throughout their marriage and would try to manipulate her and other family members with his vast wealth. I gotta say, I believe all of this, too. Um, There's uh, certain uh, evidence that would point to that being accurate. Both things that had happened previous to the divorce and things that have happened since. That can point to his predilection towards violence and outbursts. Yeah, and, and I'm sure he, I mean, I wouldn't and be bribery. surprised if he cheated on her. And bribery. Well, quickly, Ethan became a pawn in their feud. They would try and pit him against the other, vengefully abuse visitation schedules, and try and win Ethan's love and affection by buying him anything he wanted. Even though Ethan was clearly not of legal driving age, these lavish gifts included a four-wheeler, motorcycle, and a new truck. I barely trust myself to drive a motorcycle, and I'm an adult. I would have been terrified to get behind the wheel of a car at 13 years no, old. No, I was terrified when I did. You yeah, know, I, I mean, at 17, permit. when I started driving, I was terrified. Well, I started at 15, but it's, I still started on very uh, empty country roads yeah, with nobody yeah. around. And probably an adult in the car my to mom, help you yes. if you needed help. When Ethan was just 13 years old, Fred allowed him to drive his new truck unsupervised to school. 
That's just a bad investment. It's a new truck. When school officials called Fred and reported the boy illegally driving, Fred threatened to just buy the entire school. When his offer was rebuffed, he withdrew Ethan from school and transferred him to a homeschool program, according to Cowtown Crime. This is how you know a man is an idiot when he's like, can I just buy your school? And they're like, schools, you can't buy schools. They're owned by the city. The principal said when she spoke to him, he was just completely arrogant and defiant, saying, my kid's the best driver you've ever seen. He can do anything he goddamn wants. He's not going to like he took it as he, he was offended that someone would say his 13-year-old shouldn't be driving a car. Just because he's a child doesn't mean he shouldn't drive. Yeah, That's exactly him, what it means. <laughs> Ethan was the golden boy to them mm-hmm. and could do no wrong and was capable of anything and everything. They never stopped to think, imagine how this might make my son feel to put all this pressure to put him behind the wheel of a freaking vehicle and let him drive to school. Also, just from a safety perspective. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, what if he you're even if he thought it was cool, there's got to be part of him that's fucking terrified. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, newsflash, your kid is the only one that drives on the street. Yes. So you're putting a ton of other people in danger, too. Completely selfish. Luxurious modes of transportation weren't the only extravagant presents Ethan's parents gave him. During a deposition, his father, Fred, admitted that he allowed Ethan to live by himself in an expensive home in Burleson he specifically had built for his son. Now, I don't know what the actual term for it, but this is uh, the fucking worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> this is literally the movie Home Alone. Have you not seen the movie Home Dude, Alone? Except Do not let a child Macaulay start. Culkin, I would trust 100% a lot to more- stay by himself yes. or drive a fucking car. He was eight in that movie. Other over this guy exactly it's again it was like we're we want to show like how cool we are but also like uh i imagine part of them just didn't want the responsibility of having a kid around their house like they had to deal with he can feed himself and wash himself we don't have to watch him that's i wonder if i mean out of sight out of mind like ignorance is bliss i don't know what's going on over there so therefore i don't have to like deal with it Mm-hmm. I wonder what the poor neighbors of this kid had to deal with. Oh, man. Can you imagine? I. That's how I get a gun pulled on me. Because you're going to go over there yeah. and kick the door in. <laughs> over there and just raise hell. At 15 years old, Ethan was already having alarming brushes with the law. In February of 2013, a police officer came upon him peeing in the parking lot of a Dollar General. Ethan was clearly drunk which was confirmed when police searched his truck and found empty beer cans and a bottle of Grey Goose vodka, according to Cowtown Crime. However, more upsetting and alarming than the booze in his truck was the passed out naked 14 year old girl laying amongst the trash. So I get I get offended when people uh, stereotype Texans as just redneck hicks. And then you have a story of someone peeing outside of the Dollar General wasted with beer cans in a truck this is the makings of a Merle Haggard song. What is going on? It would be almost comical if there wasn't a child, a fourteen-year-old child, also involved with no clothes on, yes. passed out in the cu- truck, and God knows what happened to her. Oh, it, horrifying! Exactly. I'm I'm sure we all know what happened to her. God, it's just it. He is just a picture of just irresponsibility. And again, as a parent, imagining Ella in this situation makes me like homicidal I yeah like i i would take to the streets if i found out she had been put in a situation mm-hmm. like this and especially at this point he's 16 or i guess yeah 15 so they're both minors true you know i mean i'm not saying she's not to blame also but uh, where was anybody's parents for sure in this at the same time though i was a shitty teenager and I was doing a lot. I wasn't passed out naked in a car at Pe- 14. Or but peeing in a Dollar General No, lot. but I mean, you know, I was doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. And I have, I had and still have good parents. So I can't blame the parents entirely. I hope as a parent, I pass on to Ella, like, if you're ever in a situation where you're uncomfortable, you want to get out of it. You feel like you're in over your head. You can always call me to come get you. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get pissed off. 
we'll talk about it the next day. But like, I never want her to think like, I have to hide this. Yeah, I got, well, my mom would be super mad if I called right now because I'm drunk at this party. And yeah. so I'm just going to like stay here and God knows what might happen. Like I read, I read something once about parents that had this thing with their kid that if they were in a situation like that, the kid would just text the letter X Wow. To the parents. And so the parent that way, like if anybody was watching the kid text or took their phone, they wouldn't like give him shit or make fun of him or the kid didn't feel like, oh, I can't like, you know, if I'm not in a situation where I can like text what's going on, parents would call with a, an emergency that the kid they had to come get the kid. The kid had to come home and come get them and be like, oh, man, I don't want to yeah, leave this cool exactly. party where everyone's doing heroin. But my stupid mom says that my grandma's in the hospital, yeah. so I got to go. Exactly. That's perfect. Yeah. I, my sister and I have had my our whole lives secret codes like that with one another that I won't share here for fear of murderers or kidnappers hearing them. But we and I think that those are perfectly valid things. And yeah. I I was just talking about this weekend I when I was doing more. Uh, auditioning and film acting and like commercial acting. I went on an audition, which seemed legit. I did all my mm. due diligence. I'm a smart person and I show up and he says, Oh, well, the crew actually is, um, they're all going to be late, but do you want to come wait in my apartment? Oh, yikes. And the, a jar, the door, and I had, t- my sister and I had had our code and the door, I went in the door. There's a mattress on the floor. <gasps> there's a tripod with a camera no. facing the mattress and there's a single, a uh, desk with a computer on it in the room and like clockwork I you know I sound the alarm my sister calls me so, you know she doesn't get enough credit they think I'm the actress in the family she can sell some shit and she calls and she's like hysterical and she's like mom is in the hospital you have to come and I'm like oh my god can you hear this crazy woman on my phone I've got to go so I was able to like bail out did you text her is that how I she had texted her me? I said call me in five minutes and based upon how I answered, she knew we had code words. She knew whether to say, you can call me back later or to go into hysteria so mode. Hysterics. So I answered with the right code and she went into like hysterics wow. mode and we left. Did I'm, the guy like try and stop you from Oh, leaving? for sure. He was like, can you just stay like five more minutes? Like maybe. St-. And I said, I literally have to walk out. Can you come back later? I was like, hell no, I'm not going to come what back later. Did you, what was the audition for? So he had written this movie and it I saw a script. It was an actual screenplay that he had written. It wasn't bad. And I was supposed to play, it was, I think I was supposed to play a juror or something like that, but I had put like five significant scenes. I, you know, he offered later on Paris, like laughed in my face. I said, yeah, he offered me like 500 bucks. Paris is like, that's way too much for like an independent film. Yeah. I didn't know that at the time. Nothing. Yeah. Or credit. Exactly. Or like 50 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, he seemed legit. I found his website. You know, he does pay 500 bucks porn yeah pornography <laughs> which is putting stuff what in. it sounded like he was after yeah i was gonna have to put something in some hole that i yeah. didn't want to so i'm really glad i got away but that's the like importance of these codes that you yeah. have to be like i don't i'm unsafe but it, again it's annoying because as a female slash also you never know it's like my reputation what if i was oh, i was not overreacting this is fully a porn fishing scheme but was it, this in chicago no this was here oh dang. we drove past the apartment complex where where it was and that's what triggered the memory this weekend wow Wow. So, Did you report it? There, he didn't do anything. Like he, it was just a feeling. Yeah, I was like, he didn't like not let me leave. I would have yeah. called the cops or anything. He's like, oh yeah, okay, well maybe I'll see you later. Have codes. Always That's our takeaway. Always have codes. Always leave a note. Always have codes. <laughs> always leave a note. <laughs> That's why you always leave, leave a, a note. note. Well, when the police approached the intoxicated and urinating Ethan to ask him what was going on, it was clear the teen had zero respect for authority. As reported by Caltown Crime and D Magazine, when the officer asked Ethan, uh, what are you doing? Ethan arrogantly slurred, what does it look like I'm doing? Eventually, Tanya Couch, Ethan's mother, was called to the scene. As she spoke to her son, the microphone of a nearby standing officer picked up the following conversation described by Cowtown Crime and D Magazine. By the way, I didn't know you snuck out, Tanya says, to which Ethan replies, What do you mean I snuck out? I I told you I was... uh... Interrupting him, his mother then says, Well, you're not going to tell your dad that after you go out drinking and doing this. I drank one beer, said Ethan. It doesn't matter, replies Tanya. Here's my take on this. Yes. All for show. Oh, yeah. That she's pretending to be mad. Yes. Ethan is like, 
what do you mean I snuck out? I told you I was going out. For all and we know. And she cuts him off. Because he would. She would. He would. They would drink together. Uh, she would give him Vicodin and stuff. Dysfunction. They would drink with his friends. Uh, she knew he was drinking all the time. She would text him while he was at his own house and be like, hey, just a reminder, don't drink and drive tonight. She knew all of this was going on. He probably said, I'm going out with blah, blah, blah. We're going to go get wasted. Yeah. Or he was drunk when he left the house. Even worse. Ethan was cited for a minor in possession of alcohol and a minor in consumption of alcohol. He pleaded no contest and was sentenced to probation, an alcohol awareness class, and eight hours of community service. He never attended the class and didn't complete one hour of community service. Well, somebody fell asleep on the job monitoring him. That's what I'm... How is he not then given more community service or a a citation or a fine or something how can you just like not do these court appointed things it sounds like the tarrant county juvenile system has failed several times well i mean that's probably not surprising also i once got an mip did you really (laughs) my mom knows so it's fine (laughs) my mom knows because it's kind of a funny story so i was home from college my freshman year was with my high school friends. We were all out at this place. Um, was it the place with the pipe that you hung out is. in the field? I <laughs> love the surprise you remember that. Oh, no. I, it's called the pipe. Yeah. Anytime that you talk about being a wild teenager, I just imagine that field and that big old Man, pipe. I would love... We should take a field trip out there and see it because it will bring back some great memories. But if I also I wonder if it's just like how I envision it still. <laughs> um, but we were there. We were pull- We weren't even at the pipe. We were pulled up at the like cul-de-sac or the street where you get out to walk to it to a pipe adjacent yes and um it's a known place for teenagers to go or at least it was then so the cops pull up behind us and there was a case of beer at my feet mm. in the passenger side and i put like my jacket over it <laughs> slick move yeah like Clearly, the cops won't look there. Mm-mm. And uh, one what of that beer shaped jacket is. <laughs> one of them comes over to my side with the flashlight and uh, just reaches in and takes the jacket off. Hmm. Um, and they all, they, well, they took the beer, probably ended up drinking it themselves. <laughs> I mean, and um, nobody was like drinking. Okay. So they couldn't were, get you on consumption. No, there wasn't like open containers or anything. So they took the beer and just wrote us all tickets. Here's where I thought I was sneaky. I was attending Texas Tech University. So on the form I had to fill out, I put my dorm room address. Mm -hmm. So I was like, anything they send me is going to go to my dorm room, not my parents' house. Flash forward, man, it had to have been, that was, so that was in like 1998 in like, Three or four years later, maybe even five years later. The millennium has turned. um, We're out to dinner with family. And somehow, like, minors drinking comes up. I think we're with my cousins. And my cousin went to A&M. And I think we were just, like, talking about partying. And out of nowhere, my mom's like, yeah, kind of like the time Christy got the MIP. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) I was like, (gasps) oh. I thought I had kept that under lock and key for so long Here and she are. had been sitting on it <laughs> the whole time because they had sent the information uh, to both addresses. Oh, they got you. So she knew about it, but she didn't say anything she about it. it. Also, my mom is very sneaky like that. She will know everything and just like pick a time I love to it. reveal it. But there's also probably a lot of stuff she's never revealed. Damn. She's but a- I wasn't like peeing in a parking lot or no. even actually drinking i hadn't even been drinking yeah so i mean but it was still um long story short you do get mips in texas if you're a minor with, with alcohol well because all the fun places to go hang out at are like fields and open places right that's the, the other thing come. i got it dismissed because they put the my middle initial on the form wrong on the citation nice. wrong. There is a uh, lawyer in Fort Worth that is real good at tickets. Very well known for getting minors out of tickets like that. Excellent. And I paid him like 90 bucks and it got dismissed. What a deal. <laughs> yep. Uh, I believe is Mallory. 
believe it was the attorney was Mallory. Well, He's very well known for doing that, so I don't think I'm putting throwing anybody under the bus. No, he probably would welcome the new <laughs> well, business. Yeah, yeah. Well, during civil litigation, Tanya was asked about the naked teenage girl that was found passed out in her son's truck. Tanya showed no concern for the young girl and said she didn't know how she got home that night and frankly didn't care, according to Cowtown Crime. Oh, that's nice. Oh, as a as a mother, as a human being, as a human being, especially as a mother, you see a a, a young girl passed out naked, drunk. You're Vulnerable. not concerned. No, no, because all she cares about. And she even said in the deposition, my only concern was my son. Yeah. Even though. You can be concerned. Those aren't mutually exclusive. For sure. Be concerned for your son. Also, be concerned for why he has a naked underage girl passed out in his car. Have like a heart for two seconds and offer her a jacket or a hoodie or a blanket or something. Freaking ride home. Something. Well, four months later, Ethan's reckless behavior would escalate, leaving a wake of blood and destruction in its path. On June 15th, 2013, Ethan Couch was 16 years old. He was living unsupervised at his parents' second home, where he frequently hosted multiple parties, offering booze and drugs to his high school classmates. Earlier in the evening, he had been picked up on surveillance footage at a nearby Walmart, stealing two cases of beer and piling back into his dad's red 2012 Ford F-350 truck with six of his friends. After hanging out and playing beer pong while taking shots of Everclear in the house with no adults, one of the teens who hadn't been drinking, Star Teague, told Ethan that she needed to get to a gas station. Taking shots of Everclear, you're asking to just pass out. That This is how 16-year-olds drink. There's no... Or 16-year-olds who want a party like this. They have no idea of, like, what they're even doing. No. Get the cheapest, strongest stuff, and we'll just shoot it. That's how you know when you've reached, like, maturity, is you're like... Oh, no. No, thank you. I will not have a shot. No, thank you. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Despite being entirely too wasted to drive, Ethan insisted on getting behind the wheel. Later, Starr testified in a deposition that, I was very, very hesitant. I didn't feel right getting in. Nevertheless, Ethan and eight of his friends piled into the truck and sped off. There were six in the cab, in addition to Ethan at the wheel, and two in the bed of the truck. There is nothing good comes from nope. being in the bed of the truck. No. My, Especially uh, with a wasted I teenage had like driver. A second or third cousin that... Um, 15, he mm-hmm. stood up to get his jacket in the back of a truck because the wind had blown it and fell out and Oof. did not make it. Yeah, we had a, that was one of, you know, they always say everybody had somebody kind of pass away in high school and ours was, he was in the back of the truck and they had an accident. Yeah. Anytime I see people riding in the back of a truck or even, even if I see like a dog Oof. and th- that makes me so nervous if I'm driving mm-hmm. down the highway and somebody's got a dog in the bed of their truck that. They swerve and that thing just goes flying out Mm-mm. or jumps. It's an animal at the end of the day. Yeah, it makes me so nervous. It makes to watch. me super nervous. Are there laws against riding in the bed of trucks? I believe if you're over the age of 15, you're allowed to. At last check, I'm not an expert mm. on Texas traffic laws. Also, star, sweetheart, if you're hesitant and anyone, if your gut is telling you do not do this, don't do it. For sure. Listen to your gut. It never lets us down. At the same time the drunk and rowdy teens were beginning their joyride, some helpful citizens were crowded around Brianna Milchell's car on Burleson Retta Road, an unlit two-lane rural road. In an unfortunate twist of fate, Brianna had just experienced a blowout on her white Mercury SUV while headed home from her job as a chef at a private club. When Brianna lost control, her car careened off the road and into a nearby mailbox. The owners of that mailbox, the Boyles family, Holly, Eric, and their daughter Shelby, headed outside to see what the commotion was. Shelby, 21, was home visiting her parents from nursing school when the three walked out onto their dark lawn well past 11 p.m. to find the stranded Brianna apologetic. And this is very par for the course for this small town that she hits the mailbox and they don't come outside immediately going, what the hell did you do? They're like, no, oh, my God, there to help. are you OK? Yeah, let's clear the road. What can we do? Can we call somebody for you? That is the quintessential Texan town, I yes. think. Meanwhile, Ethan Couch was barreling down the same stretch of Burleson Retta Road at 30 miles per hour over the speed limit, 70 miles per hour in a 40 zone in his daddy's enormous Ford F-350 
14,000-pound pickup truck. A drunken high Ethan had begun playing chicken with oncoming drivers. Star would later testify that she pleaded with Ethan, horrified at his driving. I was yelling at him that he needed to get over, and when he swerved, the back tires jerked and we skidded off into the side ditch. To imagine how terrified these kids were. Most of them, other than her, I think they were all drunk or high or under the influence. There's probably still a few that are have the wherewithal to be like, this is fucking crazy, like, man. Oh no, oh You've no. got to pull over, trying to reason with your peer, who, what a terrifying situation to be completely out of control mm-hmm. and the mercy of a crazy person that has has lost their mind. That's almost unconscious. Yeah. I've driven an F-250 diesel, like a big, with dually tires. I've driven an F-250. They're huge. This is an F-350. Yeah, it's gigantic. I mean, you, you can tow a trailer full of cows. I yeah. mean, it's it has a huge payload. It has a, and it's just a massive machine. It's like a monster truck yeah, size. Yeah, it is. It's it is. humongous. I had to, you, you have to like use a step to get up in it. Yeah. It's huge. It's, it's a beast. Back at the scene of Brianna's stranded car. Youth pastor Brian Jennings had also pulled his truck over to see if he could offer assistance. Jennings had two kids in the car with him and told the boys to stay put while he went out to help. One of the two kids in the car, Lucas McConnell, a family friend of the Jennings, told 2020 that the last thing Brian said was, Y'all sit tight and I'll be back in just a minute. He also told the boys to keep their seatbelts on. Brian offered to assist with the tire change. Eric Boyles drug his damaged mailbox into his garage. But before he could head back to the scene, he heard it, an explosive crash. Neighbors heard it, too, including one who was inside watching TV with a pair of headphones on. In an interview with 2020, Eric Boyle said, I didn't know what it was. I didn't think that it would involve my wife and daughter, but I knew immediately that it wasn't good. I mean, that's the sound from behind you. Mm -hmm. Not that far. And, you know, right over there, that's where they were standing. And then... I mean, this, this, how big this truck was, and it's just metal on metal. The person that was watching TV with headphones on thought something had exploded. Yeah. That's how just catastrophic this was. <sighs> a transcription of the ensuing 911 calls in D Magazine paint a grisly picture. When asked how many people are injured, the caller says, Ma'am, I can't tell. It's dark. Uh, there's kids laying in ditches. There's kids laying in the street. When a Tarrant County Sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene, he was stunned at what he found. He later told D Magazine, It looked more like a plane crash than a car wreck. The photos, look it it looks like a bomb got dropped. I have not seen, I've seen photos of the car, and that's all I'll see. Yeah. I don't want to see anything with uh, bodies, but I read the transcripts of some of those 911 calls. There were body parts strewn about the road. It's chaos. I mean, it... As many people were involved, it was more like a plane crash. Yeah. Usually a car crash is going to have two sets of people, people, maybe. But there were eight kids, nine kids alone in that truck. And then you've got multiple other vehicles Mm -hmm. involved. When authorities arrived on the scene, they were able to piece together what had happened. As Ethan came speeding down the dark road, he lost control of his dad's truck, crashing directly into Brianna's SUV. Brianna, Holly, and Shelby Boyles and Brian Jennings were all killed instantly. The red F-350 then hit Brian's park truck with the two boys still inside, which in turn flew into the road, crashing into an oncoming Volkswagen Beetle. Because Brian Jennings had smartly told the boys in his truck to keep their seatbelts fastened, they survived, as did the two passengers in the Beetle. That's, I mean, he, that's very good advice. And uh, my friend who's, her dad is a uh, police officer in this area. She said, uh, we were talking about it and she said, it's a nice thing to do to help. And I'll never blame anybody from helping. But she's like, my daddy always told me you can do more by calling 911 and having police come to the scene because they can block the road. They have lights, they have flares. Cause she said all, all they want to do is just protect as many people as possible. But even if they had called the police you'd have police officers that have been killed by this kid. Yeah. I mean, it would, it wouldn't have helped anything, you know, the F three fifty Ethan was driving, then flipped throwing the two passengers in the bed of the truck into the air before landing hard on the ground. The now upside down truck finally came to a halt. Once it crashed into a tree, the pictures of this are shocking. It doesn't even look like a truck anymore. 
and it, the truck, the only reason these kids survived is because this truck was mammoth, it's, such a beast. But even as strong built as it was, it is crumpled to, to nothing. It's, it's almost unrecognizable. Down. It's it's horrifying. The, to think of how fast and how hard of an impact it had to be to dismantle a 14,000 pound truck. Also, it dismantled human beings. Oh, for sure. And it, it, when it hit it, them, they flew 60 feet in the air. Oh, for sure. Before landing on the ground. And some of the, the, the victims said, all I remember is flying. Yeah. Oh. Ethan and his passengers had survived the crash, despite not wearing seatbelts. However, not all of them got away unscathed. 16-year-old soccer player Sergio Molina, one of the teens who had been riding in the bed of the truck, will spend the rest of his life with round-the-clock care provided by his mother and older brother after suffering a debilitating head injury. Solomon Momond, the other boy riding in the truck bed, was also severely injured upon being thrown from the crash. He suffered from various internal injuries and multiple broken bones. So in a blink of an eye, that kid goes from being a 16-year-old soccer player with his life ahead of him mm-hmm. to a paraplegic that can only communicate by blinking. Yes, that and his family's lives are forever changed, yes. too, that they have their son that they love to interact with. Now they can, you can never talk to him no. again. He's, and they sought financial help from the couches Mm -hmm. and they said no you're gonna have to hire a lawyer yep sue me and uh the mom had to you know she was they were not rich had to quit her job to take care of Mm -hmm. her son so losing even more money and the older brother has to take care of him i mean it's it's horrifying just it's not there are people that lost their lives but then they're extrapolate those losses even i mean in the whole community the trickle down effect of when something like this or any major crime or tragedy happens the people it it's not just the people directly involved injured yeah correct it's or killed the kids that witnessed brian jennings their youth pastor mm-hmm. get killed ptsd for counseling sure. for life you're never going to get that image out of your mm-hmm. head all of those people that drove up on the scene what you're witnessing like you, the families of Brian Jennings from down the street that drove up. Yes, I mean, you're you're altering the lives of so many people mm-hmm. because your dipshit ass got behind the wheel of a truck when you knew you should not be driving. Yeah, I take that back. He didn't know he shouldn't be driving. He thought, oh, I've done this a million times. Why would this be any different? It's just no one ever told him you shouldn't be driving. I uh, there's so many points at which this could have been stopped as far as. Don't let him in his house. Buy it. Don't give him his own home. So many. Don't give him his own money to buy his own uh, gray goose. Yeah. Where did he get the gray goose? Did he get it from you? Where did he get the truck? No, he doesn't have a job. No. He's obviously either stealing it from you. You're probably just giving it to him. Stealing it from Walmart. Or you're giving him money to do it. Yeah, or stealing it from Walmart. He was failed time and time again by his parents. Uh, Yes. Amidst the screams and chaos, Eric Boyles rushed from his garage to find his wife in the yard. Once I found Holly, he told 2020, I knew that she was gone. Then it was a matter of, okay, so where's Shelby? But Eric's beloved daughter was not at the scene of the crash. The impact of Ethan's truck was so powerful that it had sent Shelby 20 feet down the road, where her father eventually found her slumped against a neighbor's fence. And again, this man has to watch his entire life in the blink of a ripped away from him, alcohol soaked eye, Mm -hmm. just. And if he hadn't drugged the mailbox at oh, the garage, he would have been gone too. So then, or if he had drugged the mailbox earlier, I yeah. mean, just think about that. And so he probably has survivor's guilt. That's and what I, I was mean, just about to say. Stuff. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm sure he grapples with, I'd rather, would have rather gone with him than mm-hmm. live without them. You know, I mean, it's, fuck, man. And it's also why this angers me. Like I said, this is the most angry case I've researched to date is because it was all so preventable. For sure. From years before this happened. Yep. There's it just it pisses me off in a way that like other crimes haven't. Mm -hmm. Marla Mitchell, Brianna's mother and best friend, had been on the phone with her concerned daughter when the horrific accident occurred. Upon hearing the crash and fearing the worst, she rushed to be by her daughter's side. 
as she frantically ran up to the wreckage, an intoxicated Ethan Couch stumbled towards her, slurring his words as he said, You don't want to go that way. There's nothing good happening over there. He then stumbled away into the darkness. What a peach. I honestly think he was so blackout drunk. Oh, he had no idea. He doesn't even know what he's doing or saying. Mm -mm. But we all, I mean, what what is the classic saying? Um, You speak the truth. You know, you whatever it is. You speak the truth when you're drunk. Yeah. Even when he is barely able to function, he knows enough to be like, I got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. Ain't my problem. This mm-hmm. is something somebody else is going to clean up. He's not remorseful. He doesn't act concerned. He's, he's not, not trying scared. to help. No, he's just doing his thing. And she say, stumbles off into the darkness. Yeah. A passerby, Shanna Clark, was with her teenage son, Corbin, when they drove upon the wreckage. They spotted an unconscious man in a nearby ditch. It was Ethan Couch. Shanna told Corbin to go to his side and offer him comfort. Once Ethan woke up, he took one look at Corbin, a fellow teenager, and told him through barely conscious speech. Hey, man, I am Ethan. I can get you out of this. Corbin recalled to ABC News. I guess he thought I was involved. One, he's so fucked up, he doesn't even know who he's talking to or who his friends are. Who invited you to the party? Two, again, he still has the wherewithal to know, like, I'm not going to really get in trouble for this. I'm kind of untouchable. My parents will take care of a man. Who cares? Fucking wild. Yeah. That, and that is clearly it's ingrained in his psyche yes. and subconscious that it's fine. There's no consequences yes. to my actions. Yes. After being taken into the police station, Ethan's blood was drawn. Three hours after the incident, his blood alcohol content or BAC level was 0.24%. The legal limit in Texas for drivers over the age of 21 and the standard in most countries for legal intoxication is 0.08 percent. Alcohol metabolizes in the body at different rates, however. So while it is impossible to know his BAC at the time of the crash, it was certainly higher than 0.24 percent. At 0.35 percent, most people become unconscious. Ethan's blood also tested positive for marijuana and Valium. So he's on a massive amount of depressants. What his a quarter of his body is alcohol. Yeah. A quarter of his fluids is alcohol. I mean, that's so high. He there's a good chance he just like passed out at the wheel, oh, and that's sure. why they skidded off into this car. For sure. You know, I mean, he. I I'm shocked that he was even able to walk, walk, or keep his eyes open in mm-hmm. any in any capacity. Point two four percent. People die from less than that. For sure. Way less than that. Especially how slight he was and the age. Yeah, he was a small, he's a small guy. I think it speaks a lot to how much he drank and did drugs, though. If he has a tolerance built up at 16 where he can still somehow function a little bit with his blood alcohol. Enough to be dangerous. Yeah. That's, he had a tolerance. And after three hours at 0.24, man. I would not be remiss if it was I mean, point three zero or higher when he actually got into the wreck. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And that may be, you know, he may have been around that unconscious level. And then weed and Valium. Yeah. Those are three depressants. You are just shutting your brain and body and body functions down. On, it's the, the trifecta of, For sure. of fucking yourself and everyone around you. God. The Tarrant County DA's office did not take this horrific event lightly. They charged Ethan with four counts of intoxication manslaughter, a second-degree felony punishable by two to 20 years in prison, and a $10,000 fine. He was also charged with two counts of intoxication assault. They took it very seriously. It was not... As they should. The good for them. And quite honestly, they're the only ones in this whole mess that didn't have their heads up their ass. The DAs in this case are valiant efforts to try to do as much as they can, despite uh, high odds. There was arguably no question about the facts of what had happened. Ethan had been very intoxicated. He had been the one behind the wheel. And his actions caused the violent and tragic deaths of four innocent people and injured two others. Ethan and his attorneys decided that he would plead guilty to the charges, but opted to have a hearing to determine his punishment. That's where this story went from a local tragedy to a national controversy. Judge Jean Boyd, who was to preside over the case, 
had a reputation for seeking rehabilitation options for minors, or at least Caucasian minors. Because of this, prosecutors Richard Alpert and Riley Shaw knew the likelihood of Boyd certifying Ethan to stand trial as an adult was slim to none. Rather than seek this, the prosecution decided to focus their efforts on convincing Judge Boyd to sentence Ethan to a Texas youth corrections facility. You try to get as best as you can, you know, do the best with the judge that you have. Yeah. And And she had a reputation for, above all else, she wanted to rehabilitate certain teens. And they knew he very much well fell into this category. Mm -hmm. But she could have decided he could have stood trial as an adult. Oh, for sure. Also, question. Was there no jury because he's pleading guilty? Correct. He pled so they didn't need a jury. And you can opt for either a jury or a bench trial. But sometimes when you plead guilty, is there still a jury present? No, they don't call the jury. If you're going to plead guilty, you plead at a pre-trial plea hearing. And so if you enter a plea of not guilty, then it would move to trial. And then if you enter a plea of guilty, then they won't seat a jury unless the parties or the judge agrees. I think in juvenile cases in Texas, it's judges that determine punishment for juveniles. But in adult cases, you can the parties can argue over whether a judge will determine your punishment or a jury. So like my mom did jury duty one time and it was like a kidnapping case, like a, a couple, a husband and wife had kidnapped one of their neighbors basically to rob him. And there was so much evidence that they did do it. There was basically security footage and the cops stopped them and all this stuff. So they pled guilty. But rather than have the judge sentence them or accept the offer that the prosecution gave them, which I believe was uh, five years, they opted to have a punishment trial, basically, where my mom was seated on the jury with other jurors and they go through all the evidence of what happened. And as my mother says, we gave the bitch 25 years. <laughs> so because it was egregious, they like, kicked they this guy's door They should have taken the, yes. the plea deal or maybe had the judge sentence them. But I assume they did that because they thought a jury, their peers would be sympathetic, more sympathetic and lenient. I will say my friends Y'all didn't know Nancy McKinney was on that jury. No, she's the, the, <laughs> she's the Texas hammer of justice. <laughs> I will say my friends that are district attorneys say that they have a wall of fame where they'll have someone's what their charge was, what the DA's office offered them, and then what a jury gave them. And it's always like five times more. The jury does? Yes. Yeah, because they're... For sure. You wasted everybody's time. They're pissed off that they're there. Also, they kind of are having their day in court. Rarely do people get the power to punish others. To punish someone, especially if it's like a hot button case like this or something, Mm -hmm. where people are very opinionated and have a lot of feelings about it. Yeah, you don't want just some Joe Schmo off the street being like, well, I'm about to finally get to tell somebody what I think is something. <laughs> you don't know what they've got going on in, <laughs> in their personal life. Well, yeah. Also, I think in, in a lot of times if you have a jury determining guilt or innocence and then you have them determining the punishment that they may consider, well, I'm like 90 percent sure that they did it, but I'm not like life in prison sure that they did it. So I'll give them whatever, 20 years versus if someone comes in the court and goes, yep, I did it. I kidnapped a person. What are you going to do to me? They're like 25 years in jail. Yeah. I just pointed dramatically when I said that <laughs> 25 years in jail. So I think it takes a little bit of the bird, the guilty burden off of the juror's mind of they don't feel bad giving someone no. a terrible sentence because they know they did it because you admitted that you did it's it. It's your civil duty. Duty to duty to duty, 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 duty. <laughs> to hand down the law. Yep. And that and especially if you don't have to grapple with like, what if I'm wrong? What if they really didn't do it? They're like, oh, you did do it for real. All right. Go to jail. So it's it's hard. It's hard as a, a defendant. Well, he, he his uh, defense or like you said, in, in Texas, he because he was a minor wouldn't have had a jury. Decide I don't the think so. Phase yeah, anyways. I don't. I think it would. It's the judge. And frankly, if I was his parents, I would be like, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, let it be a judge. Oh, hell yeah. You don't want a bunch of other parents who are like, what have y'all done? You idiot. Who is this little prick sitting mm-hmm. here showing zero remorse mm-hmm. throughout the entire thing? He tr- I, I could not have cared less that he was there. It seemed like all of the proceedings to him, it just... This is my opinion. It just seemed like it was a hassle. Oh, yeah. He seems irritated to be there. 
the the just parents kind of staring off into space. The half parents the time. seem very frustrated. Like, can't we just write y'all a check? Why are y'all making us sit here? Everybody just seemed like it was very. Who gives a shit? Why are we here? It's not a big. It's a fucking big deal. You killed four people. Yeah. You paralyzed someone. You stole these lives from these people. It's a huge deal. But they all three of them just treated it like, why? I don't know why we're all here. Why are we wasting our time here? It's such. Can I just buy this courthouse? Such a disconnect. No. It's so. It's. I don't want to say fascinating in a positive in way, a positive yeah. way, but in a interesting and just I can't wrap my head around how people can have that mindset. And Disregard as, of how your behavior as parents. If Ella got into an accident and killed four people, I would be horrified. I would love my child and support her. But if she was to blame, I would want her to suffer the consequences that. You know, that's how you, how would, how's anyone going to learn? How's anyone going to grow as a person? I think it's in South Dallas. They just had a shooting at a basketball game, high school basketball game. And the assailant shot a former student that was there. And I, uh, last I checked, he was in critical condition, but still alive. And there was video surveillance footage and the cops put it on the news and said, if anybody knows, guess who walked him into the, the his mother, his mama walked him into the police station you know and what? said, good for her. She said, you're going to go in and you're going to tell him what you did and, and we're going to settle it. Good for and her. You're going to live up to what you did. But that is, I mean, you have to have respect for her. That is so fucking hard to how do hard? that. Yes. But think about how, A, what he's learning, B, as her, as a human being in society, like this is a person that's caused harm. I have the capacity to stop them from causing harm and also do the right thing and doing it. That's so, I mean, it's huge. It's huge. If you know, he did that and he knows you know he did that and you do nothing what message does that send him Mm -hmm. well i can shoot a kid and my mom isn't gonna you know turn me in or do anything what's after that for sure which is exactly what happened with with ethan Mm -hmm. there were no consequences ever laid out to him if you do something wrong you suffer consequences you own up to it it was if you do something wrong in our eyes, it's not wrong. So fuck everybody else who thinks it is wrong. And we're going to save the day and write a and, check and write a check to these people. And then the check's going to bounce and I'm going to go to jail. For it. <laughs> God. I know for as rich as these people throw around that they are, I was like, you've been passing bad checks like your whole life. In December of 2013, Ethan Couch's sentencing hearing began. Due to the family's wealth, they were able to assemble what ABC News described as a powerhouse legal team complete with expensive expert witnesses. Scott Brown, one of Ethan's defense attorneys, asked the judge for sympathy. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram quoted Brown at trial as saying, What Ethan needed was structure and love. What he got was stuff. Don't reward Ethan because his father has a successful business, but don't punish Ethan because his father has money. People look at the carnage and say, No, he has to be locked up for 15 or 20 years. That's not justice. That's vengeance. No, that's justice. That's justice. When you do a crime and you go to jail for that's justice. And a lot of times in America, people don't do crimes. They go to jail anyway. And that's not justice, but it happens. So in this case, somebody or just go to jail. You did it. You said Here's you did thing it. Here's the thing, too. Um, just because your parents were pieces of shit doesn't mean that you also have to be a piece of shit. A lot of people statistically have shitty parents. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, a lot of nice people that have turned out really well yes have had had shitty parents and a shitty upbringing yes just because your parents were pieces of shit like i mean i don't know i don't know at nine years old what you could possibly do to to stand up to something like that uh, sure. honestly so yeah he had parents that set him up for failure for sure that does not mean that he shouldn't be held accountable for what he does. Absolutely. And in, in fact, a court of law. In fact, it, arguably, he they're the only, the justice system's the only thing that's going to hold him accountable and help him. Yeah, this is kind of, okay, who's failed him over the years? His parents. This school system. Every authority figure. Anybody he's ever come in contact with. All right, but here come the big, big guns. Here come an actual judge that can do something. And what happens? Or we'll just continue doing what he's known his whole life. One of the aforementioned expert witnesses the defense called was Dr. G. Dick Miller. Dr. Miller introduced what would become known worldwide as the affluenza defense. A combination of the words affluent and influenza, the word was used to explain the reason for the crash. Ultimately, 
the defense argued that Ethan was so rich, so spoiled, and never subjected to supervision, rules, or punishment that he could not have known right from wrong. If I had a bucket, I'd throw up in it right now. I have no words. I just have no words. I don't understand how a person who presumably went to school, presumably went to graduate school, presumably has a license. 100% did or they wouldn't have a license to practice psychology. Has the uh, lack of moral turpitude to get on the stand. He said as soon as it came out of his mouth, he regretted it. But you can't unring that bell. It's fair. And that bell ended up getting rung from all the mountaintops across the land. I mean, it, it took off in quite a way. Dr. Miller claimed that although Ethan was mentally advanced, at 16 he had the intelligence of an 18-year-old, he was emotionally about age 12. This meant that he had no rational link between his actions and their consequences. That's like every man. I have a nephew that's 13, and I promise you he knows right from wrong. For sure. So 12 years old, a lot of 12-year-olds know what... (laughs) What they do is right and what is wrong. I think that the argument completely falls apart that he doesn't know right from wrong when in his unconscious state, Mm -hmm. Corbin's like, hey, man, you feeling okay?" And he goes, don't worry, I'll get us out of this. Getting out, the implication is that there's some trouble that you've gotten into. Ergo, you know what you did was wrong and you shouldn't have done it. Yeah. So I don't... I don't give a fuck what planet you're from. (laughs) If you... If you flip over your dad's truck, you see bloody human body parts all over the fucking road. People moaning and screaming. Every It's complete chaos. No matter if you've lived in a bubble, you know innately this is wrong. What I did was wrong. This is a tragic situation. It's My thing is, is... He knows right from wrong. He just doesn't like consequences. No. And, that's and he's not... never been given any. So he really doesn't even know what the consequences would be. No. I mean, well, he's been given them, but he disregards them. And then there's no consequences for him disregarding it. And again, my I'll get into it a little later. But I think that the argument that he doesn't know right from wrong is completely empty based on his behavior when he's caught doing stuff. Yeah. If he he knows what's right and wrong, this isn't his first brush with no, the law. No. When that cop walks in him up on him pissing with the naked girl in his truck, he obviously knows he did something wrong or the police wouldn't be there. For sure. And, and I think he's written a ticket, you know, mm-hmm. for, so he knows that the things he's doing are wrong because the police get involved and the police get involved when you commit a crime. He's been he's pled before a court before he pled no contest. Yes. So you get it. If I drink, that is illegal, that is wrong, and I get a ticket. If you want to plead this bullshit defense, do it the first time he gets in trouble. That's true. Not the 27th after he's killed four fucking people. Yeah, he. I just don't think it's, it, does, it's, uh, it doesn't stand up. Well, this defense, of course, was bullshit. According to the assistant criminal district attorney, Richard Alpert, the reasoning that Ethan committed this heinous crime due to privilege and wealth was ridiculous. In an interview with CNN's Anderson Cooper, World-renowned psychologist Dr. Drew Pinsky said, It's a cute, clever twist of phrase that the psychologist should be ashamed of himself for having brought into the courtroom. And even more shameful is the judge for having fallen for that nonsense. God, I love Dr. Drew. He's so hot. He's a silver he's fox. So hot. He, Tommy has a man crush on him. Oh, Dr. he's been a... Oh, yeah. I don't doubt it. He's been a silver fox since ne- the he, love line. He also... So is Anderson Cooper. Oh, yeah. Those two in an interview? <sighs> Whoa! Yeah. Get Turn me up. a freaking... Something wet to put around my neck. You say, turn up the AC. <laughs> I'm sweating over They're here. They're both so fine. He's also extremely good at his job. Oh, yeah. He's compassionate. He's caring. He knows his stuff. And so for him to flat out call out a fellow psychologist and be like, you should be ashamed of yourself. Absolutely, this guy should. How much money were you getting paid as this expert witness, I wonder, to come up with this ridiculous and laughable defense i think you and i have had this discussion of how much money would it take for you to lie or fake something like that and we both said we don't have a price there's no you can never get that integrity back no and that's all you have at the end of the day yeah in the end in the end what matters but who you were yeah and and what your name goes down in history yeah and all of these people's names are going to go down tied to this case yeah Well, the prosecution asked for 20 years as punishment for this egregious crime, well below the maximum they could have requested, 20 years for each count. However, Ethan Couch was sentenced to just 
10 years of probation for the four lives he took and the countless others that he ruined. I'm going to repeat that. 10 years of probation for killing four, paralyzing one, and grievously injuring another. Six people. Ten, not No jail time. Uh-uh. Probation. Uh-uh. It's He's 16 by 26, which is you still got your whole life ahead of you. He may have had He's good behavior. He's done with probation. Yeah. If they, if they would have given him jail time, he may have had good behavior and got out earlier. But 10 years. He may have also learned something. I don't know. A trade, perhaps. <laughs> just now not to be a complete This is a person shit. that just needs to be completely kept from alcohol. Yeah, for sure. Judge Boyd also claimed that she didn't believe Ethan would receive the rehabilitation he needed in a juvenile detention facility, one the prosecution was requesting to which he be sent. According to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, Judge Boyd said at the time of sentencing, Ethan, you are responsible for what you did, not your parents. The court is familiar with the Texas Juvenile Justice Department and has sent numerous teens to programs there, and sometimes... They don't even get in the program we designated for them. So let's analyze this. Ethan, you are responsible for what you did, not your parents. Doesn't seem like it, according to her sentencing. Yeah. Doesn't, it seems like that's kind of a hypocritical statement. That he's, uh, she may hold him responsible, but she's got a little bit of a different view on how to show it. Yes. Well, therefore, in addition to the 10 years probation, Ethan was to attend the Newport Academy in California. A private rehabilitation center described by the Daily Mail as a luxury resort. The Newport Academy offers basketball, a swimming pool and six acres of land. The CEO describes the place as like a comfortable home and with activities and amenities like mixed martial arts, massage and cooking classes. It's no wonder why the exclusive facility only accepts a maximum of six patients annually and charges $450,000 per year to attend. This sounds like uh, a resort. Sounds, sounds like a vacation. I'd love to go on. I would love to. I've never been to a place that nice. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> it's so fancy. Uh, I mean, kind of makes everyone want to get a drug addiction so we can experience this, this magical wonderland. Although $450,000 a year. That's yikes. It's <laughs> crazy. I went to this website. Yes, it's the photos. The photos I I gave me pause because it's all a bunch of I mean they I'm sure they are very very wealthy kids. I can't imagine their actual patients. I'm going to say models. I'm going to say they're models. Okay. They all look very happy, very just, you know, we're on a hike. Nothing could go wrong. It's I don't know. I, I, I hope that the kids that go there get what they're needing out of it. I also like that it's called the Newport Academy, not like a facility. Exactly. Or a center. On some level, you're teaching these kids that like, we can put a spin on this Mm -hmm. and put a bandaid over it and, and make it, you know, um, we do it doesn't have to sound as bad as it it's really not so is bad sometimes things should sound as bad as they are because that's the only way you're going to get slapped in the face with reality and change your life you need to take your medicine you got to hit like they always say on intervention until somebody hits rock bottom there's nothing you can do to help them mm-hmm. and if you're not allowing someone to hit rock bottom they're just going to keep going back to their old ways this is going to keep cycling Upon Judge Boyd issuing her sentencing, the courtroom erupted. According to Cowtown Crime, Ethan Boyles, who had lost both his wife and daughter in the blink of an eye, said, Money always seems to keep Ethan Couch out of trouble. Ultimately today, I felt that money did prevail. If he had been any other youth, I feel like the circumstances would have been different. I feel like that is correct. I would agree with him, that poor man. That you watch... A slippery shit get away once again. In this case, he's getting away with taking your whole family. When all y'all did was try and offer a helping hand. Mm -hmm. Your daughter's home from nursing school and you just, you're all probably watching TV. You hear something, you Mm -hmm. go outside to help. And then the blink of an eye, your whole life is ripped away from you. I can't believe it. 
When interviewed by 2020, Prosecutor Richard Alpert said, There can be no doubt that he will be in another courthouse one day, blaming the lenient treatment he received here. When asked how justice could have been served, Alpert replied, Justice would have been served if the system had held him accountable. Mic drop. Alfred knows what's up. He tried, though. I mean, can you imagine ha- having to go and look those family and the families in the face and say, I'm so sorry. I tried so hard. Yeah. I tried so hard. Also, what a laborious and just daunting case to have from the beginning when you know who the judge is, you know who the family mm. is, and you know that you're just kind of up against the worst of it. And it's just a fighting battle of being understated. You kind of see the end. You can yeah. imagine how, visualize how it's going to end before. The community and nation were understandably outraged, especially given that just a year prior, Judge Jean Boyd had sentenced a 14-year-old black child to 10 years in juvenile detention after his actions killed just one person, resulting from a punch. Although the two cases weren't entirely similar, it was a stark contrast showing the outcome wealth can have on the justice system via expensive lawyers and expert witnesses. Yeah, I imagine that kid probably didn't have an expert going, well, you know, he was, you know, disadvantaged and that's why he did it. Or his mom did this or his dad did this and that's why he did it. They just had to come in and say this is what happened and she sent him to jail. Prior to Couch, Judge Boyd had seen another juvenile drunk driver in her court. In 2004, 16-year-old Eric Bradley Miller was drunk on vodka when he sped around in a stolen pickup truck with the lights off. He then hit 19-year-old Philip Andress, killing the young husband and father. Judge Boyd sentenced Miller, the son of a teen mother addicted to drugs, to 20 years in custody. Technically, Miller had committed a felony when he stole the truck and was therefore charged with felony murder, resulting in a longer sentence. That was kind of the technicality of this case. However, uh, I did read different articles that said that Ethan was in possession of his dad's truck without his dad's knowledge. So the question is then, is that a felony stealing the truck? And then would that then could that conceivably be felony murder? Because in Texas, as in some other states, if you're committing a felony and any person dies in the commission of the felony, you and anybody that's also committing the felony can be charged with murder. Would it have been a felony had the dad not reported it stolen? If he has he dad just said, said yeah. Oh, I, I don't care that he took it or I knew he took yeah, it. Yeah. And that's the argument is he's probably would say, oh, no, he was allowed to have it yeah. even if he wasn't. Yeah. So then you wouldn't be able to pin it on him. Yeah. In the midst of the backlash, Judge Boyd attempted to turn the tide of public opinion in a closed door hearing. Rather than the luxury Newport Academy with its horseback riding, Ethan was instead ordered to stay at a state run lockdown rehabilitation facility in Vernon, Texas a small town three hours northwest of Dallas. In addition to the criminal charges, civil charges were also filed by the families of all four victims and two of the passengers riding in the truck with Ethan. All of the cases settled out of court, even the one that had originally asked to have a trial by jury. That was There was one family that was very insistent on having a jury trial, and they, they took a settlement. The couches claimed they were bleeding money from all the civil suits filed against them and were unable to abide by the court order to pay for their son's treatment, a bill that now totaled $200,000. Because of this, Judge Boyd amended her original order and gave them permission to pay a much reduced fraction of the bill, $11,000. These people are, uh, they were real braggy about how they much spend money they spend the money have. on the things they want to spend the money on. Yep. And they're real tight pursed is that a phrase that is i don't know is it i think so tight lipped tight purse you can have a tight purse too tight wad um when it's stuff that they don't feel like it's their responsibility to have to pay yeah i can't it's sickening to me yeah it's nauseating well and what you said earlier too about well can we get some help with the medical bills no better sue a lawyer yeah lawyer up once again the nation was unhappy with judge boy's leniency And on December 23rd, 2014, Judge Jean Boyd retired as the presiding judge of Texas's 323rd District Court after an online petition calling for her removal received more than 30,000 signatures. So she was first elected, I think, in 2004, if not earlier than that. But then she was reelected in 2010 without opposition because judges in Texas are elected. And this is why it's so important to be so aware of your she had this reputation of this rehabilitation for some maybe send another ones to juvie 
And when there's a situation like that, some good person has to stand up and run against somebody. Yeah. And that's the problem is you or have start an online petition or start to, get an online, her, to get them to retire. Yes. Start an online petition mm-hmm. or have someone run against them because it, that's what happens when local elections, when you don't pay attention. Yeah. Upon being released from Vernon State Hospital, Ethan was admitted to a transition program located in Amarillo, Texas, called Next Step. He stayed there until being released in February of 2015. While their son was going through the motions and treatment, Fred and Tanya Couch, who in their on-again, off-again relationship had since remarried each other and subsequently once again divorced, continued to have their own legal issues. In August of 2014, charges of impersonating an officer were filed against Fred after he flashed a fake badge to actual cops that had shown up to a public disturbance. Unsurprisingly, Fred entered a plea of not guilty. While these charges against Fred were still pending, he had yet another run-in with the law in January of 2015. The audacity it takes to show a fake badge to a real cop. <laughs> That's stupidity. In the article, uh, Caltown Crime did a, a really good three-parter on this. And the author of it said, my biggest question was, why? <laughs> He had exactly. nothing. It wasn't even the disturbance wasn't at his house. He just happened to be where it was. He wasn't even involved. Just he was leave. just a spectator. Why even do that? If not, but to just stroke your own ego and kind of fuck with people. That's the only motivation there. That's It's just the stupidest thing, yeah. especially given the massive amounts of issues you've had in yeah. the past. That's what I'm the, the he he's a sociopath. It must be something that just doesn't click. It doesn't click that this is wrong and you're going to get in trouble. That's, yeah, like a sociopath. Yeah. He doesn't understand like what he's... There's just a major disconnect. With Fred as passenger and Tanya behind the wheel, Tanya backed into another car, effectively wrecking the vehicle. Instead of doing the decent thing and exchanging insurance information, Tanya and Fred sped away, leaving the victim of the accident stranded. Luckily, witnesses had written down Tanya's license plate number, and police were able to quickly apprehend the couple charging Tanya with leaving the scene of an accident. Once again, though, the case settled out of court, with the couches paying what they called restitution to the woman whose car they totaled, according to Cowtown Crime. You know, the cops looked those names up and went, you sons of bitches. (laughs) You again. They're like a rash over the justice system in Tarrant County. As part of his probation, Ethan Couch was barred from taking drugs or consuming alcohol for 10 years. But in early December of 2015, a video surfaced on Twitter that showed Ethan with several of his young male friends playing beer pong. The Twitter user who posted it, at Blonde Spectre, included the caption, Your boy Ethan Couch violating probation. I got more if you want it. And tagged both the city of Burleson and the Tarrant County DA's office in the tweet. It takes one person that you're shitty to to do a video like that you know ethan couch is at a party maybe he shoulder bumped this guy maybe he shoved into him and this guy's like or maybe what? this kid was good a head on good head on his shoulders That's like true. this piece of shit what what's he doing <laughs> you're here? not allowed to be here first of all i was winning my game of beer pong then this asshole showed and up. also you're you killed so many people yeah. why are you here we're not hanging out with you i hope that um that was it. He just knew. <laughs> just a good this conscience. This is wrong. Yeah. Or she, Blonde Spectre, you could be. Oh, that's true. Well, I think he was with a bunch of dudes. So okay. I'm assuming it's, it was a guy. When reached for comment after the video surfaced, the DA's office confirmed to the Dallas Morning News that it was investigating the alleged probation violation. When his probation officer reached out to him, Ethan was nowhere to be found. This was yet another violation of his probation. On December 16th, 2015, just two years into his 10-year probation sentence, a warrant was issued for Ethan Couch's arrest. You mean he can't follow rules? Imagine that. Shocking. Investigators learned that after the video had surfaced, Ethan and his mom held a going-away party, indicating they would soon go into hiding. Tanya then withdrew $30,000 from the bank, according to Cowtown Crime, and the two fled the country and headed for Mexico, specifically Puerto Vallarta where they checked into a luxury resort. However, the hustle and bustle of the tourist area proved to be too high profile for the pair, and they eventually moved to a condo off the beaten path where they could lay a bit lower. Just like they think it's a life is a movie. <laughs> God. Let's just run to Mexico. First of all, if you're going to flee to Mexico, you're going to go stay at a luxurious resort. Not a good use of Second your Second question. 
uh, what was their plan? I don't think eventually that- the money's going to run out. You just do you live in Mexico now? Yeah, I, they're not a real brain trust, Christy. It's, I don't think it's very just reactionary. Not a lot of thought being put into a long term, long term plan here. No, not at all. I, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked that they didn't have a lot of foresight. Eventually, their cravings of the creature comforts of home brought Tanya and Ethan down. The pair had a hankering for Domino's Pizza, and when they used one of their own cell phones to order the pie, U.S. Marshals who were tracking them were able to alert Mexican authorities. The fugitive mother-son duo were then found later that same day. Man, Man, what is something... Pizza pizza will bring you down. I was going to say, what is... Pizza will drag you down. My question to you is, what is something that you would risk being arrested arrested in Mexico to get? Dots, pretzels. (laughs) I knew that was the answer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, nothing, really. Like, I'm not going to flee the country. For sure. But it is these things. It's all... I mean, we've seen in other cases, too, like a serial killer doesn't change the tags on their Mm -hmm. car or has an expired license or something or Mm -hmm. tries to, you know, buy just some mundane thing because you get complacent. Although these idiots have been complacent their whole life. It wasn't like they were even really trying. They They were born complacent. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. They're just on a a holiday as far as they're concerned. What about you? Oh, I was thinking that as I was driving home today because... uh, you know, I probably the there's a, a place called Snooze that's a breakfast oh, yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. They're out of Denver, but they they're in Dallas too. And they have these pancakes. They're gluten free pancakes. You told me about these pancakes with pineapple in them, and yeah. they have a coconut drizzle. It's so good. In fact, when I told you the restaurant that has been under construction in Casa Linda, a shopping center by where we live, when I told you, do you know that's a Snooze? You looked me in the eye and you go, "Fuck you." <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> You're like, they have the best gluten free pancakes I've ever tasted in my life. They're so good. They also do everything gluten free, so I can get avocado toast or pancakes or eggs Benedict. So it's it opens up a whole world of breakfast, which is my favorite food. Is breakfast? That's how I feel when I go to a place that is a uh, vegetarian or vegan oriented and i'm like i could have anything on the menu so many options i don't have to worry about it but that also gets me into trouble because then i'm like i have to have everything on I the should menu. try six entrees yeah i because i feel like i gotta take advantage of this mm-hmm. do you get like that with gluten-free stuff i do and we went to a place for breakfast a couple of weeks ago and i got a meal that had a pancake and a french toast and I ate all of it. Oh. And I was like very ill afterwards. And I was like, I flew too close. French to toast. Sun. Yeah. French toast is one of those things that I, the first couple of bites, I'm like, oh, this was a great decision. And then halfway through, I'm like, this was a terrible it's decision. It's so filling, but it was really good. It's a place called Cozy and everything on their oh. menu is gluten free. Tommy and I did not have a good Cozy experience. It was one of the worst meals we've ever had. What did you order? <laughs> I ordered a steak omelet or something that had like steak in it and all, and then he got um i think he got french toast huh. with strawberries um unfortunately we did not have the same cozy experience that you did but uh they have some cakes there too that are like their cakes looked very good i did not <sighs> all gluten free out of this world so is is everything gluten free do you have to request it almost everything's gluten free or you can request it it's you just have to tell them Maybe that's why he didn't. Well, his was just, it was cold and it wasn't cooked well. Oh, that's not good. But I don't know if maybe if it was gluten free and he didn't know if that would have changed. No, you have to pay extra. Oh, okay. Then he probably just had regular. When discovered by Mexican authorities on December 28th, 2015, Tanya and Ethan had changed their hair and appearance. Ethan had dyed his strawberry blonde hair and goatee black, and Tanya had chopped off her normally long hair. They had also ditched their forms of identification and were evasive with questions. Fed up with their antics, authorities took both mother and son to a jail in Guadalajara for transfer back to the U.S. You know these cops were like, these fucking gringos. Idiots. (laughs) Well, and they had gone, they'd been shopping at the local stores, so they were out and about and people were recognizing them. They also had, uh, were the worst hotel guest at this resort <laughs> and right. from the beginning the staff was trying to get them to leave and even lied and said like you're gonna have to find another place to stay we're completely booked for the holidays and just tried to get them out and out because they were just so so shitty imagine that <laughs> shock again shocking 
Some criticized the use of so many state resources to catch what amounted to a teenage probation violator. Tarrant County Sheriff D. Anderson told the New York Times, Go talk to those four families who lost loved ones and who spent Christmas without their loved ones because he decided to drink three times the legal limit of alcohol and drive recklessly and kill four innocent people. The details of the crime and then the lack of justice in the sentence outraged people in this area in a way that I have never seen people outraged. That's true. Which and This you, is such a hot button case for people. Because it, it's just this shithead teen that got away with literal murder. And now the DA and the sheriffs and everybody and the marshals can say they lost out on justice at the initial sentencing. The least we could do is try to bring them justice yeah. now in carrying out the Good sentence. Good for them. Because his whole entire life has been people going, eh, fuck it, it's not worth it. Also, we kind of skirted past the fact that his mother was like, let's just flee the country. <laughs> I'll go get 30 grand. We'll go to Puerto Vallarta. And the audacity of having a going away party before they did this, like it's a joke to them. Yes. It's a complete joke. She doesn't they laugh in the face of justice for sure. And she doesn't think this is illegal. This is wrong. We or shouldn't. do they? And they just don't care. Yeah. I want to sit these idiots down in a room <laughs> and, and ask them that. First do of all, really, how dare you? <laughs> do you really? not think what you're doing i mean she had to have known it was wrong or they wouldn't have left the country she knew that he was going to go to jail again it's one of those things where it's not that these people don't know the difference in right and wrong they know they just don't give a shit they think the rules don't apply to Mm -hmm. them they're literally above the law they're not but they think they're they think they're above the law Mm -hmm. and whoever told you you were worth a shit (laughs) who told you that you're different than anybody else And shouldn't have to play by the same rules. You ain't nothing but trash with money. Come on now. At 100%. You're the asshole that drives up on the side when everybody's trying to wait to get on the freeway or and thinks you can just shoulder your, bully your way in. She's the one that tries to drive people off yes. the road. Or yeah. hits their car and drives away. Again, who hurt you? For sure. What happened who to you? did this? Really, that's what, I mean, they all need to be in counseling. Uh, Definitely. Extensive counseling. And somebody needs to get to the root of what happened to lead to all of this and what can we do to keep it from happening yeah, to other people? what do we learn from this as a society so we don't let this happen again how do we like help each other so things like this don't continue to happen well ethan's probation was being administered in accordance with his status as a juvenile meaning penalties for violating that probation was a maximum of jail time until his 19th birthday which was a short four months after his arrest in mexico meaning he would be released in April of 2016. But the district attorney's office pursued a transfer of Ethan's case to adult court. The transfer would mean that each violation of probation could result in 120 days of jail time. A hearing was held in January of 2016, and Ethan's case was successfully transferred to adult court. Again, it's a case of these district attorneys were doing as much as they could, and it seems incremental, But this is that's a step. That's another step to getting them justice and doing as much as they can. That's amazing. At a probation violation hearing held in April of 2016, Judge Wayne Salvin sentenced Ethan to 720 days behind bars, the maximum possible. Ethan spent two years in jail and was released two years later in April of 2018 and ordered to wear an ankle monitor. He was also still banned from consuming alcohol and was subject to a 9 p.m. curfew monitored by the GPS ankle monitor. The ankle monitor also tracked any alcohol use. For nearly a year, things went seemingly well. And on March 22, 2019, Ethan's ankle monitor was removed by court order. Things did not appear to be going as well for Ethan's troubled parents, however. In December of 2016, Fred was finally convicted of impersonating an officer, a crime he had committed two years earlier. He was sentenced to probation. Three years later, in July of 2019, Fred was once again arrested in Fort Worth and charged with assault of a house member by impeding her breath. Allegedly, Fred grabbed a woman, reportedly his girlfriend, by the throat or neck. Spiraling. Not, I'm, I'm not surprised by any of this. For sure. I, well, luckily, he he at least got sentenced to something, although it was only probation, yeah. for impersonating a police officer. That's egregious. Yeah. And then... The, so is no, choking saying, a woman. And then 10 times worse or more... He's now committing violence against women. Yeah. 
It's which I mean, Tanya claims he had their whole marriage mm-hmm. that he'd hit her. He'd thrown her into a fireplace. Tanya's older daughter claimed that she saw him slap her when she was pregnant with Ethan. So, I mean, it was a history of abuse and, and violence against women and substance abuse and uh, uh, mental health, m- mental health problems. Tanya was also back in the legal spotlight. In connection with the flight to Mexico, Tanya had been charged with money laundering and hindering the apprehension of a fugitive. While out on bond in March of 2018, Tanya failed her urinalysis test by testing positive for an illegal substance. She spent two months in jail following that failed drug test. Upon release, she was arrested again after testing positive for methamphetamine. For the third time, she was arrested in June of 2019 for again failing a urinalysis test. During these proceedings, Tanya filed an affidavit claiming that she was indigent, with no income, and only a $2,000 2006 Ford pickup truck to her name. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Somebody needs to put her in a rehabilitation program. She's having troubles. She's she's struggling. This is a person that cannot put the substance down. No. When it says... It sounds like from the... Ethan's childhood, this has been a problem. Decades long. Yes. Ethan's seemingly good behavior wouldn't last for long. On January 2nd, 2020, at age 22, Ethan Couch was arrested once again. This time he failed a patch drug test, testing positive for THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, the primary component in cannabis. Ethan's lawyers vehemently denied any wrongdoing telling CBS News that Ethan had been monitored for nearly two years and has never been positive for the use of any substance before. They also told CBS, We cannot make any further statement until we have the opportunity to conduct an investigation to determine if, in fact, Ethan ingested THC, and if so, if it was a voluntary act on his part. So maybe someone dosed him with THC. <laughs> this is like uh, when they say, oh, the Halloween, they're going to give out drugs. I don't think people give out drugs. Isn't it on the office... They do the pop drug test and Michael thinks he's going to test positive because he was an Alicia Keys concert. Well, he's like, she handed me something. I thought it was a clove cigarette, but it may have been marijuana. Maybe yeah, he thought it was just a clove. smoking a joint around him and, and uh, now he's going to test positive. That's what it was. Ethan was released from custody pending further investigation. His positive was considered a weak positive and authorities in Tarrant County are looking into whether Ethan took marijuana or whether the positive was a result of legal CBD oil usage. I don't know about the enough about the science to know if CBD would do that. Um, it could, depending okay. on the type of CBD you have uh, or you get or how it was processed. So I think like there's like raw CBD or there's CBD that has like different um, percentages of um, CBD in it So or, or in stuff. So I think... From my research, it is possible. Is it likely? Given his history, I'm no expert, but I'm going to say no. I'm honestly surprised in two years. That's the first time? He he tested clean those entire two years. I feel like somehow he found a loophole. (laughs) There's something. Because that behavior doesn't just stop. No, and without counseling. No, without like severe rehabilitation Mm -hmm. and counseling and like an, an... an effort on your part to want to change and better yourself. And he never seemed to show any of that. So not throughout anything. Yeah. I don't know. So what does the term affluenza actually mean? It is not an actual recognized illness. It does not appear in the diagnostic and statistic manual published by the American psychiatric association. Clinical psychologist, Christopher J. Ferguson wrote an article for time magazine titled affluenza is junk science. In that article, Ferguson reiterates that he has never seen another mental health practitioner diagnose someone with affluenza. He also notes that the concept is scantily discussed in research literature, writing, In the computerized database PsychInfo, the term affluenza is mentioned only seven times, as opposed to over 101,000 for the recognized illness of schizophrenia. Most of these seven were mentions or reviews of books published in the non-academic press. Meaning this is a made-up term. <laughs> yeah. Additionally, the twisted way in which Ethan Couch's attorneys used the term wasn't even in line with prior uses of the concept. Ferguson described affluenza as... Generally characterized as a contagious social disease, 
typified by a keeping up with the Joneses materialism, spending, and debt. Not the lack of responsibility or knowledge of right from wrong based on wealth. Ferguson concedes that Ethan Couch may have suffered from other issues or mental health problems, including alcoholism or possible personality disorder. Which is fair. For sure. If if he'd had witnesses that were there or psychologists there to that wanted to actually help him and uh, not just getting paid by mommy and daddy to get him off, perhaps it would have been a different outcome and he would have received the actual help he needed. Actual rehabilitation. Got a diagnosis that could have gone somewhere. But Ethan Couch's defense team and expert witness, Dr. Miller, didn't invent the concept of affluenza. The concept has been around since the 1950s, but was popularized in 1997 in a PBS special called, aptly, Affluenza. A few years later, in 2001, the authors of the documentary also wrote and released a best-selling book of the same name. Those authors were John DeGraff and Vivia Bowe. Similar to Ferguson, DeGraff and Bowe defined affluenza as a painful, contagious, socially transmitted condition of overload, debt, anxiety, and waste resulting from the dogged pursuit of more. According to an editorial penned by DeGraff for Time magazine in the wake of Couch's prosecution, the purpose of the documentary and book was social criticism, not psychiatry. The documentary was meant to be partly tongue in cheek, even including a small comedic segment. And DeGraff wrote in Time that he and Bo laid bare the ugly consequences, both social and environmental, of America's obsession with wealth and materialism. DeGraff readily admitted he and his co-author were appalled by the sentence Couch received. Yeah, the whole bit of their their documentary and their book is that, quote unquote, affluenza is me and my husband, Bob, are, you know, accountants and we make pretty good money. We're middle class. We drive a Subaru and you and your husband, Brad, move in next door and you guys drive Mercedes because Brad is a hedge fund manager. And I tell Bob, Bob, we have to get a Mercedes. And Bob's like, we're accountants. I can tell you, we cannot afford this Mercedes. And I'm like, do what it takes, Bob. And he gets a subprime loan and then we're in debt and we can't pay for the Mercedes. But then you guys also get a pool. And I'm like, we need a pool too. That's the affluenza, right? It's the, you're trying to be as good as your neighbor or as yeah. fancy as Instagram now, I guess, nowadays. But that was the 90s of what you see on TV or who you see at work. It's a keeping up with the Joneses. Yes, it has nothing to do with this the- idiot had nothing to keep <laughs> up with because everything was his parents and was handed to him. He didn't have his own money. No, it's, it has nothing to do with culpability, nothing to do. It's a complete misuse of the word. Yeah. It's just being like, well, you know, I, I have uh, foot and mouth disease. Oh, what is that? It's not a thing. Like that's yeah. that's saying like you accidentally said something wrong. No, it's a disease, so I can't come to work. It's it's a term that exists, but you're using it totally wrong. Yeah, and like Doctor Miller said, as soon as he said it, he was like, "Oh, oh shit!" Have said that, but you got to dig in at that point. I made a huge mistake. Yeah, you can't just be like, "Oh, you actually, I, I'm wrong. I misspoke." You just got to keep going, and he dug that hole deeper and deeper. Mm-hmm. Well, it appeared the entire nation was appalled by the light and laughable sentence. CNN, ABC, and many other national news outlets covered the outrageous story. Ethan Couch became known as the Affluenza Teen. Family members of the victims were interviewed to express their outrage with the sentencing. Alex, the brother of Sergio Molina, the teenage passenger who was paralyzed in the accident, said in an interview with the Dallas Morning News, That kid killed four people and crippled my little brother and doesn't even have to serve one year. If he were poor like us, he would have gotten 10 years, I bet. He is not wrong. Oh, I don't think so. Not by any stretch of the imagination. And that's not, I think it's definitely partially coming from a place of, you know, a little bit of anger and resentment. But I think it's also coming from experience yeah, and coming from what you see and coming from the past history of the judge involved. Yeah. And the past history of the rich white man in court. In in general, in in life. life. (laughs) For the past (laughs) century, millennia, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. The beginning of time. So what do we think? You know, they always say, I don't think money is the most important thing, but it's right up there with air and water. I mean, if you have money, you can afford expert witnesses. You don't get a court-appointed lawyer who... Let me just make clear our phenomenal lawyers, people that work in the public defender's office. It is not easy to get that job. However, 
you do have a lot of cases. You don't have the resources to hire the experts that you necessarily would want to. So absolutely, I think that people like Ethan Couch can buy their way into the justice system, A. And B, I think, this is a, obviously his parents were too freaking stupid to do this, but it's it almost, have you ever heard of the Streisand effect? Yes, but refresh my memory so like it's when barbara streisand i believe she bought a house and she said i've bought a house no one look at my house don't take photos of the house i bought stop taking photos of my house and the more that you mention it and draw reverse psychology yeah it's almost no but she really didn't want people to instead of just buying the house and shutting up about it she bought the house and was like if you take photos of my house i will sue you and everyone's like well we got to take a look at this house yeah it draws more attention to it so i think in this case he the accident happens he kills these people it's so tragic either go to trial or take your sentencing but i think in trying to and i get it the lawyer has to you have to vigorously defend your your client. You know, you have to zealously advocate on behalf of your client. However, in so trying to wriggle out of culpability, like wriggle out of, of taking your medicine, he is now and will forever be known as the affluenza teen. Yeah. This thing that should have been, you know, 10 years probation. Say he would have gotten 10 years in jail. He would almost be getting out of jail yeah. in a couple of years and it would be all well over and done with. But no at this one point, would know his name for the. I mean, exactly. Some pe- the people who's victims of the families but For we sure. wouldn't know his name no It'd we be wouldn't in be just another accident and we happened. wouldn't be in doing an episode about it yeah. and so and i and i don't you know a lot of times you get well why are you naming it after the perpetrator or why are you giving him attention in this case when somebody googles ethan couch i hope this show comes up and they mm-hmm. hear what a shitbag he is but also there were so many victims that would have been uh, the longest episode title ever. <laughs> My gosh. But seriously, he I, I, I think it's, you know, is it well deserved at the end of the day? Is it some kind of justice for their family that even if he say he would have gotten 20 years and he served it quietly and he got out, they probably would have preferred that. Right. But now is it at least some sort of an upside that for the rest of his life, he'll be he may be in and out of jail or whatever. But for the rest of his life, he'll never escape this. I good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a you've given him a life sentence. And it's not enough. He you should have gone to jail. You want to scrape grief for sure of somebody being ripped from your life like in that. front of you, yeah, directly in front of you. So I don't think he's he definitely has not been properly punished. He he hasn't. He should have gone to jail. He should have gone to hard jail, real jail, not not Newport Academy jail. Even though he didn't end up he going didn't there. Go there, but, but yeah, we can't turn back time we can't change unless we jump the quantum tracks and you know go into the other realm of existence we can't change what happened so i think maybe the next best thing is that he lives a life that he he can't escape he can't escape you know he's stuck but does he care exactly i don't know i mean if that's a good point if you live that really good point even if you live that life if you don't care what does it matter that's true Man, I honestly don't think it phases him. That's a good point. He's still I, I was playing thinking. beer pong with people. If I had done what he did, I, I can't even. You can I mean, never drink it's again. It's hard to fathom even being able to go to a party again, let alone be playing beer pong. The thing you were playing the night that you got into this, your dad's truck and plowed down four people. Yeah. How can one that isn't a complete psychopath like keep doing do those things again yeah and i I've, i don't understand how a judge or anybody else could live with themselves knowing this person so it, it would be one thing if this was the first thing he'd ever done right if he had you know oh my gosh well we did you know he just started drinking it's the first time he got drunk but he had been before not just caught drinking they didn't just catch him with a case of beer at his feet with his friends at the lake he was shit hammered drunk pissing in public back sassing a cop with an unconscious victim in his car yeah. and he clearly and then did nothing that he was required to no community service he didn't check in when he should have so you can see that this being released on your own recognizance and saying well will you do some community service and maybe go to rehab and come back oh yeah sure i will bullshit you didn't do it before you're not gonna do it now so i think that's where she failed in her sentencing yeah she's not, ignorant for thinking that that would even happen th- for not get the track record exactly for not saying oh well before you did this or whatever and so i think i don't know how you could live with yourself i don't know how you could shut your eyes and go to bed at night knowing that this person who does not have any regard for punishment i mean this is a person that needs to be locked away from society because you can't trust him no look at what he's been doing he's he's uh, a menace to society yes 
And even when he was out, they're like, oh, well, you're cool. We'll take your ankle monitor off. Want me to go to Mexico, like, right yeah. now? And you're like, yeah, Jesus, again, man. Like, why take his ankle monitor off? <laughs> I don't know. Because he's been good for a couple years. How about he has to be good for the entire time he's supposed to be good? Yes. If it's I given him a rash, had... switch feet. He, <laughs> he just doesn't. He's, I think he's gotten enough free passes in his life to where somebody finally has to be like, no. Fuck this the guy. The buck stops here. You're going to be held accountable to the fullest extent of whatever we can do. And Judge Selma did do that. Yes. I mean, and yeah. the, and the attorney, finally someone did it. And the DA's office ha- repeatedly has done their job as best to their best of their ability to, to handle. And the sheriff's office in Fort Worth. I mean, they really were trying to right this wrong that yeah. happened. And it just kept slipping away from them until yeah. finally. That's Your point is so good, though, that because uh, I was thinking as a normal person. That, oh, he's not a normal person. That you'd be like, well, that would be really embarrassing. But no, he doesn't give a shit. I don't think he gives a shit. I honestly That's a don't. a point. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see um, what comes of this recent probation violation. Mm-hmm. I don't know what he's doing now. I mean, one thing, although does it matter if your parents are loaded? I don't know if they are still or the dad after all this, still, but yeah. it would be very difficult to get any kind of high paying job or even decent paying job with all this on your record. And that's what Tanya Couch said. She said, well, I only have $2,000 and I can't get a job because as sure as they see my name or Google me, they don't want to hire me. I'm like, well, I don't really think that that's like has to do with your kid. I think that's probably has to do with you. Your past. Yeah. You've got a rap sheet that is quite impressive as well. And, you know, they might not care about like their reputations, but that's something. If yeah. They can't. Something- they're not they can't continue the lifestyle they were accustomed mm-hmm. to because they can't make any money. You can't provide for yourself, so I don't does does uh Fred still own the sheet metal place? I think he does, but I'm not sure. I mean it looks like it's still it has websites and stuff. It only has one point three out of five stars. Well I imagine a lot of that had to do with after this came out. May I read this review on Facebook? Please. You can run all you want, but you cannot hide from the entire planet who hates you and your weak ass kid. Someone will rat you out and your money will also run out. If you don't think that they are not tracking you, you're crazy. I think that that was uh, 2015. That's when Ethan Couch was. uh, But I guess that that was to his mother. That message was directed to his mother. But they were right. They found him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, (sighs) this has been a doozy. It's a long one. A long one, and man, I'm going to have to have a glass of wine to be able to go to get bed. I'm so riled up. (laughs) I'm feisty. I'm feisty. Well, let us know what you guys think. A sinister head will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the costs of making and hosting the show, you can visit SinisterHead.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini-sode. We also do bonus content, including a live Facebook Q&A this month, as well as mixed bag episodes where Christy and I share three of our favorite things from the past week or so. So those are a very fun thing to participate in, and we always share links to the things we talk about so you can check it out for yourself you also get ad free episodes on the episodes that we have our fab fit fun ads we upload ad free episodes to the patreon lots of bonus content and make sure you stick around after our sign us to hear your special patreon shout out so many of you have been tagging us in photos of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Please keep those pictures coming. And if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pot and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I am on Instagram at Heather versus the world and on Twitter at MCK versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Amy Patterson. Kate Allen. Natalie Waldbrook. Caitlin. Danielle Robinson. Sonji Bianca. Samantha Witt. Aubrey. Ashley Oxley. Kylie Wheeler. Mylene Rivera. 
Aaron M. McConkey, Sydney Jackson, Chelsea Carter, Casey Brown, Lindsay Weidman, Mackenzie Hartmeyer, Jackie, Melanie Ryan, Jennifer Edwards, Lane Price, Amanda Miller, Orkitas Martinez, Lane McCabe, Stephanie O'Neill Miller, Tristan McQueen, Tia Wiersma, Jackie Bosamonte, Holly Shea, and Maya Patterson. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. We love you. Keep it creepy. <laughs> Cine-